Welcome. Everything is great. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 5, Existential Crisis. This episode was written by Andrew Law, directed by Beth McCarthy Miller, and it aired October 12th, 2017. And let's get right into it, because we have a lot to talk about. Ooh, goody. Lots of philosophy. Vicky's in charge, and Michael's unhappy as her employee, irritated with what he believes are very simplistic torture ideas. Chidi begins his ethics lessons with Michael and Eleanor while Tahani and Jason prepare a party they know is doomed to fail. Chidi forces Michael to contemplate death, and in doing so, Michael experiences an existential crisis. So right away we get Vicky in charge with the other demons, I believe Quentin and Gunner. Uh, yep. Okay. And they're really stuff. into high fiving. They love high fiving. Does that mean high fiving is bad? Because I like to high five. Yeah, but like a bunch of bros high fiving all the time. Oh uh, yeah. And they keep calling each other babe, I've yep. noticed. And mm-hmm. in that Seinfeld episode where Elaine's boyfriend, Buddy Keeps high-fiving Jerry, and it's really annoying. So okay, that's well, what it always reminds me of. Like, excessive high-fives are bad. Yeah, yes. I agree. You just need a sprinkling of high-fives. Yeah, use them lightly, loosely, and sparingly. Exactly. We find out that Michael's idea of the mindset of a human is, like, purely based on biology, not at all on what it feels like to be human. Right, we're not constantly walking around like, look at my dangly arms, or wow, I can really feel the hairs on my head. Yeah, exactly. We're not thinking about how, oh, my breathing tube is right next to my eating tube. How silly is that? Yeah, that was a design flaw, which it pretty much was. It really is. So, there is that, but... And the idea, like, the little sticks at the end of our arms, which is weird when you think about it, but makes life easy. You know? I think that's my favorite thing that he says. Yeah? I think this episode just proves to me that Michael really doesn't have any idea what it is to be human and what humans are really like. Mm -hmm. Because he's so focused on torturing them and their weird biology and all these other things that he doesn't really think about the experience of a human being. And I think that's reflective on... I think that's reflected in all of the interactions that Michael has had with humans, their whole entire torture system is based on the biology of humans. It's all physical. It all has to do with physical torture. Oh, yes, yes. The real bad place. Yes, in the real bad place, their torture is all purely physical. Right. They don't have anything that attacks you, your humanity. Mm Mm-hmm. What makes you human. It's all just... Let's pull off their fingers or let's burn them or let's put things in their butt or, you know, all of those things are physical. So it seems to me like all these quote unquote demons don't understand what it means to be human. Yeah, not at At all. all. No, no. And because of that, they're less effective at torture. So I guess you could say that this episode is kind of touching because Michael has his first truly human moment. I guess that's touching. I don't know. Michael's still a dick. Well, yeah, he is, but it doesn't mean he's not finally beginning to understand the human experience. Right. So perhaps he will become enlightened. Hmm. I like it. Chidi's lessons are already working. Boom. Yeah, and he didn't even really teach anything. No. Just like a sit down one on one like this was coming from the book of Chidi. Ooh, I like it. Except not his actual book, which had, like, the longest title on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So moving quickly to Tahani and Jason this episode. So this part is so frustrating because Tahani knows exactly what their plan is. Yeah. And she falls right into it. Mm -hmm. Completely aware of everything they're trying to do and just basically holds their hand and walks them through torturing herself. Yeah. She's like, hey, you guys want to torture me like this? Here, let me help you. She's so full of herself. She thinks somehow this is going to be different. She's very stubborn. Yes. Very stubborn. But to give her some credit, she learns her lesson at the end. She did. And there's something I've noticed about Tawny's parties in general. She seems to make the decor very beautiful. She's probably got like 
catering plan down to a T, but she never has any activities going right. on. No activities. Is that maybe because she was always surrounded by sophisticates, so they just wanted to like talk to each other and like shout smart things mm -hmm. into each other's faces? That's probably very likely. Yeah, because Vicky's party we see later has all these different things happening, all these different fun things going on. It's exciting. Yeah, there's activities for people. It's not just talking right. with, I don't know, classical music in the background. And people pulling out their checkbooks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tahani knows how to plan a classy gala or charity ball, but she doesn't know how to plan a rager. So shall we just dive into the philosophy at this point because it's brought up really quickly in this episode. So Chidi just comes right out of the gate saying, If you live forever, then ethics don't matter to you because basically there's no consequences for your actions. You tell a lie, who cares? Wait a few trillion years and the guilt will fade. So first of all, I like that in Chidi's mind it would take a few trillion years to get over the guilt of lying. Some people get over it in seconds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stares off into the camera like it's the office. <laughs> but second... Not only is Michael immortal, but he's been programmed by his society to be evil. So it's not as though it's just a matter of his immortality. It's a matter of his society and how he's been programmed and what he's learned throughout his existence. You think he's evil by nurture? Yes. You don't think and he was nature. born a demon? Yes, absolutely. But I think that's it. Like, you are born a demon and you are programmed to be a certain way. Like, by society, not in a computer programming kind of way. No, no, yeah. But everyone around you is like, yeah, evil is good. We torture humans. That's how life works, right? So it's not as though Chidi is only going to have to overcome that hurdle of Michael's immortality, but he's also going to have to overcome the hurdle of Michael's social programming he's gonna have to reprogram him yeah definitely and the only way to do that is to break him down piece by piece and it's interesting like michael presents retirement as this physical torture of being scooped out with a flaming ladle being placed on the surface of a million suns but chidi doesn't represent it that same way he presents it as a void as nothingness just end and these are really, really different. It appears as though Michael, when he does actually begin to have his existential crisis, is finally able to switch over to Chi's way of thinking. It sounds to me like Michael is focusing on the torture aspect of his death mm -hmm. instead of the absence of everything, the absence of himself. Yeah. And when Eleanor later says... You know, he thinks about his death for one forking minute and he totally loses it. I think it's because he's never thought of retirement or death in this particular way. Right. Because we know he's thought about retirement mm -hmm. in season one. Yeah. But and he hasn't thought about what that means besides the torture aspect of it. Well, I think it's just presenting you with a different idea of what death is. Mm -hmm. Because... In a lot of religions, you do have a certain idea of hell, right? So when you die, if you've been a bad person, you're going to go to hell and you're going to be tortured. Mm -hmm. In that framework, you're still basically alive. You're, you're still, still existing. conscious, you're still experiencing sensation, right. and you are being tortured, which is horrible, but it's not as though you cease to exist. Yeah, you're not in a void. Yeah, whereas this other idea of death, of just nothingness of just the end of you is i think a lot more frightening for people mm -hmm. because it's just nothing and we can't really conceive of nothing right as much as michael's you know kind of cartoonish very sudden existential crisis is i think it makes sense mm -hmm. i think it's just that really strange realization that you could just be done you could just not be yeah it's a little frightening at times for sure i get it mm -hmm. now i know that when we were watching it together you said that you believed michael was forking with chidi of course he looked like he was absolutely faking it <laughs> so how did you feel when he wasn't i still feel like he is oh yeah 
Oh. I still feel like Michael is pulling the wool over their eyes. You really don't trust him? No. Okay. I do not. I am totally Eleanor in Team Cockroach. Okay, and you still, in this episode, do not trust at all. Jason, who hurt you? I don't know. Why don't you trust? (laughs) You don't know me. (laughs) Actually, I do. Pretty well. (laughs) So, the reason I don't trust Michael is just, I think everything happens, everything that he does is so over the top Mm -hmm. that it's confusing. He freaks out almost immediately. I kind of get that because I'm sure his brain power is astronomically large and he can think about things really quickly. Probably not as quick as Janet, but still. And suddenly, like extremely quickly after he gets inspired by Eleanor, he gets a car and gets Jeanette and changes his whole appearance and personality. Everything just happens way too quickly for me. And you don't think that that's just a product of comedy writing? No, I don't think, based on what we've seen of this show, that anything is done purely for anything this big happens just for laughs. Hmm. Okay. It's it's tough because I know they have to get Michael to understand ethics. And the only way to get Michael to understand ethics is for him to understand death. But to me, it just doesn't feel like I can trust Michael at all. I. You totally do. I do, yeah. Um, I really do. Is it because we've already had the untrusting Michael scenario in season one? Perhaps. I guess I attribute most of the speed and the like cartoonish exaggeration to comedy writing on TV. Okay. I think it's just trying to get a laugh out of us while also still presenting like an idea of What really happens to human beings? Which, by the way, Michael going through like a mid-eternity crisis is very human. It's Mm -hmm. so human that we see all the little traits and we can immediately identify it before anyone even says what it is. Right. As soon as he pulled up in his car, I immediately said midlife crisis. Yeah. He walks out with that ridiculous white suit, the hair all weird, and Jeanette. And the earring. Oh, gosh. The earring. Oh, my goodness. Yep. We already knew what it was Mm -hmm. because it's so human. Right. And that only happens to human beings. Like, you don't see turtles going through a midlife crisis. It happens to us because we are aware of our mortality. Mm -hmm. And we suddenly want to do everything we should have done when we were younger. And we want to experience life to the fullest before we die. Right. And that's a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I guess... It doesn't really bother me. I don't feel like Michael is untrustworthy at this point. Okay. But uh, I'm excited to see if one of us turns out to be right, because one of us has to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 50-50. Unless, of course, The Good Place takes like this insane twist, and somehow both of us are right, or neither of us are. Ooh, I like that, because that seems like something the show would do. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Moving on. Moving on. Before I get too much in the existentialism discussion, I did notice that when... Eleanor is asking Michael if he wants a snack. Ted Danson kind of has this look, and he looks a little like a velociraptor because he's just, he's got his hands like really close up to his face and he's looking around like really angrily and kind of (laughs) twisting his face up. And it just makes me laugh. You're not trying to say valedictorian, are you? No, no. Oh, (laughs) Oh, man. If he was looking like a valedictorian, he's like (laughs) miming that he has a diploma and a a hat. One of those weird hats. Graduation cap. Is that what they're called? Do they have a special name? They probably do. And it's probably hard to say. I'm gonna look it up. (laughs) All right. So let's get right into our discussion of existentialism. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's (laughs) dive right in. Okay. I'm so excited. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Jason. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. So existentialism is a... That was a great lesson. Thanks for listening. Good night, everybody. Clearly, he is the Eleanor to my cheaty, so... This lesson sucks. (laughs) Harsh! Shush! Okay, be quiet. Remember last episode where I mentioned that Michael's reaction to these lessons would be to fart all over it? And he would go... 
Yeah. I was totally right. He did not fart. There were no, no farting sounds. he said, sounds. this sucks. And everything that you put in your syllabus is stupid garbage. Yeah. Yes. Nailed it. Well, this won't be stupid garbage. It'll be interesting if you like this kind of stuff, which if you're still listening to my podcast, you probably do. Your I'm podcast. I'm sorry. Let's backtrack a second. <laughs> this is my part of the podcast. Let's pedal it back. Okay, pedal forward again. Okay. And if you're still listening to our podcast, then you probably like that. Emphasis on our. Okay. So existentialism is a philosophical and literary movement that arose in 19th century Europe, but didn't truly really rise to prominence until after World War II. Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche are considered the first existentialist philosophers, although neither of them use that term. Other notable figures include Fyodor Dostoevsky, Martin Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Albert Camus. Existentialism can be a challenge to define, as many of the notable figures had profound differences, and some even rejected the label. And a lot of its ideas are reaction to other philosophical ideas. But even so, there are a few assertions that the majority agreed with, and one of them being that existence precedes essence. Plato and Aristotle believed that our essence exists in us before we are actually born. Mm -hmm. So this idea that human beings have an innate purpose given to us by a higher power. So, for example, God. Some believe that our lives have purpose, our lives have meaning, because God has given us a meaning. Mm -hmm. um, but existentialists disagree, because they believe that we exist first, and then it is up to us, no one else, to figure out our own essence, our own purpose. We define our own meaning. Exactly. Right. And that is key to existentialism. And so, although existentialists vary widely in their views on the human condition, they share a common rejection of systems that promise to have definitive answers to the question of the meaning and purpose of life, such as Christianity. So is this similar to absurdist existentialism? Well, uh, the absurd is a key part of existentialism, yes. Okay. Definitely. So many existentialists see a benefit in confronting our mortality and the temporal nature of our existence. Because they think that when we accept the inevitability of death, we gain the strength to live our life authentically. So once we understand death and know that it is inevitable, mm -hmm. we can finally start to live our life. Yeah, exactly. It's sort of like, oh, I know I'm going to die. I know that there is no meaning or purpose to my life. None that has been bestowed upon me anyway. Mm-hmm. And so I'm allowed to live my life how I see fit. I'm allowed to give purpose and meaning to my own life. I don't have to search for it in someone else. I don't have to try to live up to other people's expectations or a higher being's expectations of me. Mm -hmm. Right? So some might see this view as kind of depressing, thinking there's no meaning to life. What's the point? Right? But existentialism isn't nihilism. We're not saying that everything is meaningless, so feel despair, but more that we have this overwhelming freedom to do what we want in our lives mm -hmm. and to choose our own essence. Just to put this, give us some little context, in Rick and Morty season one, Morty plainly and pretty accurately states pretty much everything you just said. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's going to die. Mm -hmm. Come watch TV. Yeah. Now, I'm not certain if Rick and Morty overall takes a more existential or a more nihilistic view. So I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But from what we see in this particular episode of The Good Place, Michael is having this existential crisis because... He is so focused with the absurdity of life. So for existentialism, the absurd is actually a technical term. It means the conflict between the human tendency to seek inherent value and meaning in life and the human inability to find any. So we're always seeking answers in this answerless world. Right. At that moment, when Michael has just begun his existential crisis, Chidi says he's going to go get some book by Camus. 
And I think that's perfect. I think it's exactly what he should be doing because Camus always believed that we should embrace the absurdity while also defiantly continuing to search for meaning. And he's not saying, oh, hey, acknowledge that life is meaningless, but find meaning, because he rejected the idea of going forward and trying to find meaning and purpose in your life through religion, for example. He saw that as a bad leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just figure out your own personal subjective meaning and purpose to your life, that was okay. That was what he meant by defiantly searching for your own meaning anyway. Right. Yeah. I do wonder which book of Camus Chidi was going to go get. And I think it might have been The Myth of Sisyphus, which is a story about a man who is condemned to repeat the same meaningless task of rolling a boulder up a mountain only to watch it roll back down again for eternity. Mm -hmm. Because that's just an exploration of the absurd. But Camus was always saying, well, you have to imagine that Sisyphus is actually happy. Right, because his... His the meaning of his life is right there. He has a purpose, and it's rolling this boulder up a hill. Yeah, over and over again. That's his purpose. And, he has meaning. And if he has subscribed to that meaning, if he has decided this is my personal and subjective meaning to my life, then he is happy, and he has faced the absurdity. Mm -hmm. He's done a good job. Which is bizarre. But yes, definitely. And a little absurd, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, it's really interesting to think of it that way. Yes. It's interesting because before I did any research at all on existentialism, I just kind of assumed that it was basically nihilism, mm -hmm. which is like life is meaningless. What's the point? And it's a much more bleak outlook on life, whereas existentialism, though... It might give you a little bit of a crisis at first because you're staring into that absurdity and our lives are so built around having purpose and meaning that it can be terrifying to think that it might not. Mm -hmm. All of this might not have any meaning at all. Right. They're still telling us, hey, you can make your own. You know, you can still find happiness and joy and, and purpose in your life. You, you just have to figure own. out for yourself. Right. Which also comes with a terrifying feeling of freedom. Oh, and also, holy crap, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. Like, Chidi describes this existential crisis as it's an anguish people go through when they contemplate the silence indif silent indifference of our empty universe. I was struck by the word anguish because it's actually a technical term that uh, Jean-Paul Sartre used to describe the feeling when everything is terrifyingly possible because the freedom that comes from creating our own meaning is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like like you can do anything. You can do whatever you want. Exactly. And the idea that you can reject all of society and do your own life and live for yourself is amazing. But so overwhelming. Like, where do I start? How do I begin? What will my life look like? It's just so much mm -hmm. at once. It's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. It really is. If you're at all interested in the absurd, you can check out uh, Camus' The Stranger and Sartre's Nausea because they also explore this concept of absurdity. They're very interesting. I read them a long time ago, but I'd recommend them. I should probably read them again. And here I want to drop a Buffy reference because I want to point out that Angel is seen reading La Nausée by Sartre in the season three episode Lover's Walk. Probably well, because he's dealing with like the purpose and meaning of his existence at that point after he just came back from a hell dimension. So anyway, I thought it was interesting. I always remember because... Every time I see it, I'm like, oh, you're so pretentious. <laughs> He's well-read. Being he well-read does not mean pretentious. I know. It's just because Spike is looking at him through the the glass or something, and he's like, ugh, that guy. Hate that guy. 
<laughs> so I can just imagine Spike being like, ugh, he's so pretentious. Look at him reading Sartre. And then it should pan over and there's a comic book inside the, <gasps> the book. Yes. Batman. Because <laughs> he he's thinks always he's Batman. Batman. Exactly. So he'd be reading it and he'd be like, oh, I'm going to do that. This guy's got great style. Yeah. I got a brood more. He's got a cape. Well, I'll get a trench coat. It's basically a cape. <laughs> but with arm holes. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the game 20 Questions. We play it in the car. Oh, uh, we don't anymore. No, we used to play it in the car. Many years ago, Vivian thought up existentialism as an answer to 20 questions. <laughs> so you can imagine my frustration when after like a bajillion questions... <laughs> I could not guess existentialism. <laughs> it is not a noun. It is not a thing. It is not a person. It is not a place. It's not smaller than a bread box. Or it is bigger than a bread box. Much bigger. <laughs> so we don't play that game anymore. And I will forever bring it up as the worst game of 20 questions anybody has ever played in their entire existence. Okay. Okay. She's going to defend herself. Yes. In my defense, I had just finished a course called Existentialism in Literature, and it was amazing, by the way. But it was on my brain. Jason wanted something hard. Okay? I told him it was going to be hard. Very difficult, in fact, I believe. Yeah, I thought you guessed, like, I don't know, a car tire or something. Are you kidding me? A car tire is so easy, especially when you're in a car. 20 questions, not I spy. Still. <laughs> Tires are on your mind, but a philosophical movement might not be. Mm -hmm. I was challenging you, and you clearly were not up to the challenge. She broke all the rules. I did. Of 20 questions. Okay, yeah, I kind of I kind of goofed there. But, oh well. Now he won't play 20 questions with me, guys. And nope. I always say that I'm going to be better, and I am. And yet he still does not trust me. No. Nope. I'm sorry. Oh my god. I just asked who broke your trust earlier. It was you. Apparently it was me. Dang. That 20 questions game has really shaken us mm -hmm. to our cores. <laughs> you know what? I get to decide what the purpose and meaning of 20 questions is. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along to our next section of the episode. Mm -hmm. In a flashback, Eleanor learns about death when her mother breaks the news of her dog's passing. The gang attends Gunner's birthday party and tries to conceal Michael's condition, which quickly changes from an existential crisis to a mid-eternity crisis. Ooh, clever. I see what you did there. Another flashback shows us Eleanor and her mother at her father's funeral. So we're doing some flashbacks. We are. We're getting back into the swing of it, I guess. I feel like this is the episode where the season properly begins because we are getting those flashbacks again. Everything before was setting things up. Laying the foundation. Which seems like a long time, but when I watch those episodes, I still enjoy it. I still see where what we're doing and where we're laying seeds, I think, for future episodes. Mm -hmm. So as much as this feels like we're finally into season two. It's not as though I've been upset waiting for it to begin. Right. So I don't like Eleanor's mother. Obviously, she's not a likable person. No, she's not supposed to be. But she feels too cartoony. Mm. Like, over the top bad. Okay. But I think that's it's on purpose. Mm -hmm. Obviously. I just don't like it. I think perhaps we're also seeing her that way because it is Eleanor's memories. So Eleanor might be making her seem worse in okay. her mind. Or she just does not reflect well in Eleanor's mind. Yeah. I do love that we're continuing the trend of Eleanor's mother with a glass of white wine with, with a straw. straw in it. All the flashbacks have her with that. Mm -hmm. I do love Eleanor's mom saying there's no such place as Guam. <laughs> and the whole, the farm is made up, the bridge is made up, you caught me, everything. She's... Super over the top. She reminds me of Eleanor. 
Really? She really does. Oh, wow. I don't see Eleanor in her. Really? Not no. even like a fart shaped as a person like that comment? Okay, yeah. But in this particular one, no. I don't see the... You caught me. I made it all up. Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's all just screams Eleanor to me. No. Okay. I don't see that, actually. Interesting. I see like, there are little traits of her, for sure. But her mother is so much worse. Oh, of course. Right? Absolutely. Just saying, don't be sad because if you get sad, I'm going to get annoyed. Like, <laughs> that's really Thanks, bad. Mom. So for Eleanor, expressing her feelings meant getting in trouble. So it was, of course, a lot easier to just push all that down than to have her mother angry with her. Mm -hmm. Which is horrifying because that happens to kids. Right. And I see kids like that who's parents are very obviously not allowing them to be in touch with their emotions and so a lot of that gets expressed through anger mm -hmm. yeah and that's definitely great. eleanor mm -hmm. she is her mother's daughter yep does this whole discussion of existentialism and michael's existentialist crisis feel any different because we're in a show about the afterlife how do you mean well, not that all existentialists believed that there was no afterlife. Some were atheistic, some were not. Mm -hmm. But generally, the idea was that death will be an end. Right. Right? And that we have to live the life that we have right now instead of looking towards the afterlife. Because this is it. Yeah. But Michael's life is in someone's afterlife, and... Chidi and Eleanor are all aware of the existence of an afterlife because they're currently in it. So this is simply another layer of existentialism. It's like the world within a world. So there's the simple, this is all we have on Earth. And then there's the, the next level, which we're dealing with, which is, this is all we have in the universe. So. It makes sense to me. Okay. I guess it makes sense to me because this afterlife is really Michael's life. Mm -hmm. If Chidi or Eleanor, Tahani or Jason were having this existential crisis, I don't feel like it would make a lot of sense because now they've gotten to the point where they're just immortal, I assume. Mm -hmm. Like they're just going to live for eternity. In the afterlife. Right. So there really is no end for them. Michael doesn't bring up the idea that you can somehow be retired if you're in the good place or the bad place. It just seems like you go on forever. Right. You get tortured forever. There's no point where your last day of being tortured happens and you just poof away. Yeah. It would be more efficient because I'm guessing they've got quite the backlog there. Yeah. But um, for Michael, he says it's rare to be retired, but it is not impossible. Mm -hmm. So, of course, demons don't really think about retirement very much if it happens to only a few of them. Just like we don't think about dying in a plane crash every day, unless that's your fear. Because it happens to so few of us, right? right. You're not going to think about oh, what if this bee stings me and I die because that happens to few people. Mm -hmm. But we think about death in general because we know that it is going to happen to everyone and everything. Yeah, so what you're saying is it doesn't make, it wouldn't make sense for our, our quartet to have a, an existential crisis. Oh my gosh, our quartet, I love it. So... Sorry, I just never thought <laughs> of referring to them that way and that's such like a musical term, it's very pretty. Anyway... Because it wouldn't make sense to think of them having a crisis because we already know that the reason you would have a crisis is because of death. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen to them. Yeah. For all we know. They can still see this afterlife as essentially meaningless and kind of deal with that. But the actual death part is yeah. just not a concern for them anymore. Which is interesting. Does that make Michael more human than any of them? Because he can actually die and they can't. Hmm. He's probably the only one actually experiencing what is closest to the human condition at this moment. Time. Yeah. 
Whoa. Okay. <laughs> um, on that note, I thought it was weird when he comes into the party, well, the party with no attendees, and he's saying, you know, parties are distraction from the relentlessness of entropy, and we are all just corpses who haven't yet begun to decay. Michael, they're already dead. Their corpses literally have decayed at this point. It's been 300 and something years by now. They gone. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. It's a great line, but I'm like, it Michael, work. you know they're dead, right? Yeah. You know they don't actually have corpses. Their bodies are not like a physical proper thing. Anyway. <laughs> it made yeah, me laugh. No, very true. Okay. So what did you think of Gunner's birthday party? I thought it was great that... They mentioned that Gunner was an animal rights activist and they've got all these animals performing for them. Yep. I thought it was fantastic. It was just so... I don't even think Vicky gets it that it doesn't make sense. I think she's that naive. Mm -hmm. And I love it. I feel like it was fairly subtle. I didn't hear any talk about it. Uh, I looked around on the internet and I didn't see anyone mentioning it. And I was a bit surprised because I thought, really? Animal rights activists fight against using animals as your entertainment. Yeah. And yet here we have the real Build-A-Bear workshop. A giraffe. And uh, a giraffe walking around. And we've got a uni- unicorn walking around. And Hopping monkeys, a kangaroo like... pouch. Yeah. Gross, but... by the way. Yeah, it's probably moist. So Slimy. I'm sorry that I said the M word on air mean that I did. moist yeah moist i guess moist? people don't like the word moist for some reason huh oh boy so that midlife crisis starts up real quick so we've highlighted a part we've highlighted the the best parts the hair the suit the car jeanette jeanette oh um i believe that we forgot the impulsive tattoo right um it's japanese or it's it's Chinese for Japan. Yes, that was great. <laughs> Loved it. I laughed so much at that. Oh, so Jeanette. Jeanette is interesting. Yeah, we get to see a little bit more of Darcy Carden's body size and shape. She's beautiful. She is lovely. <laughs> I feel really creepy saying that, though, because she's obviously supposed to be like this sex object. Right. He basically built her as a hottie who's yeah. a bimbo. Yeah, completely. He refers to her as his secretary, which is also so perfectly midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. But he insists that she just be there to prop him up and make him feel intelligent. And say really dumb things. Yeah. She's She's having a blast. She's having, she's along for the ride, getting spoiled and... I guess, well, I guess so. Like, she doesn't seem unhappy, but she's, of course, not supposed to seem unhappy. Right. I like it when Janet responds like, no, I'm still me. Michael just told me to do all this stuff because it would have been so much more confusing if she just walked up and really, truly pretended to be Janet. Yeah, you can everyone. still see that it's Janet and she still she still responds to Janet. And How do you feel about Janet being treated this way? I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. You don't see any problem with making her change who she is? No, she's not a person. Hmm. Maybe just me asking that has solidified that I feel like Janet's pretty much a person at this point. Hmm. Weird. She is a yeah. computer program to be changed however you see fit. So she was changed in season one several times, mm -hmm. personality-wise. Yeah. But we essentially kept the same properties for her, right? Like, she didn't change drastically. When she was hitting on Cheaty. Yeah, okay. That hat would look better on my bedroom floor. I suppose. I don't know. Hmm. I guess I just felt like this was some sort of violation against her. Like, that this was not okay. <laughs> hmm. I don't see that at all. No? Nope. Okay. The way Janet is, is she responds positively to everything. Mm, yeah, that's true. So she is happy to do this. Because she's being asked by Michael to do this. So she's serving her function. And she's ecstatic about it. But her function is to make human beings happy, not to make Michael happy. But Michael's her boss. Eh, basically, he seems to command her, so... Mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess maybe it just made me uncomfortable because... 
of who she was playing. A bimbo? Like, yeah. Well, just like a, a sexual object, right? Mm-hmm. Something pretty to look at, but it has no substance. A cliche. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, no, Janet is so much better than that. We know she is, but it still makes it funny. Yeah, I know. It's just funny to see her change in any way. If they had make her made her like this super punk rock chick, like that would be fun too. Yeah, like when we see bad Janet. Yeah. It's great seeing that drastic change. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know. Maybe there's someone else out there who feels the same as I do. I'm glad. I'm sure Darcy Carden welcomes any big change like this to allow her to act differently. Oh, I'm certain. I'm not saying this is some sort of violation against Darcy Carden. No, I, I know. Yeah. Um, And we can clearly see that Michael is like Michael's actions are not appropriate. They're not good. We're painting them as like fairly pathetic and... A little scary, I guess. It's interesting. It, he seems like a mashup of several different eras and personality tropes, I guess. He seems... He talks kind of like a surfer bro. The whole, like, I'm riding this wave of positivity. Yeah. Okay. And he's dressed like somebody, I don't know, from the 70s? I feel like it's more the 80s. Like, it's 80s? sort of a okay. Miami Vice feeling. Right. And it just... It seems like he's got a bunch of information mashed up and he's just kind of he just grabbed a bunch of things and mashed them all together and i think it's i think it's great yeah we don't have one defining era we just get a mishmash because i don't think michael could see the difference between 10 years yeah (laughs) yeah exactly yeah oh boy so this midlife crisis is just denial Mm -hmm. we're just in the in a waiting period right now because he is eventually going to fall which, of course, gives me one of my favorite lines. He's a Jenga Tower of Sadness. Yep. Which, of course, also applies to Eleanor in her flashbacks. It's just building. We're getting Eleanor shoving her feelings down for her mother's sake. And then in our next flashback, we're going to have Eleanor having internalized that lesson. That she shouldn't show her emotions. Right? And that she should just pretend like she is fine all the time Mm -hmm. and of course we will see her fall i like that line it's great it's so funny but also just so so true thinking about michael's process this episode um i thought maybe that he was going through the five stages of grief which are denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance just thought it was something that seems like he's going through okay at first uh He's basically denying the fact that he's that he has mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, he's angry when he gets to t- when he goes to Tahani's party, talking about we're all doomed and we're all dead and we're all just looking for excuses to stop thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Bargaining is his mid mid eternity crisis where he's basically bargaining with himself. He's giving himself a distraction wouldn't that be denial um no it's more he's he's giving himself something in return for his naivety he's giving himself trinkets and things and then he goes through depression because he starts thinking about death again Mm -hmm. eleanor has to talk to him gives him a pep talk and then we get to acceptance so it's possible it's a potential thing that he's going through Yeah, I feel like he's definitely going through a lot of similar emotions because he's never really considered death to be a possibility Mm -hmm. until Chidi points it out to him. Like, you realize that siding with us means that it's very possible you'll be retired. Yeah. And what if your retirement is not what you think it is? You've got this idea of it, but what if that's not the reality? Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So what do you think about the second flashback that we get of Eleanor at her father's funeral? I like this flashback a lot better. Yeah? It shows Eleanor actually being vulnerable for a moment, a brief moment, where she's looking at her dad in the coffin before her mom shows up. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, her mom comes in and ruins everything. Yeah. I like that Eleanor says to her boyfriend before her mom even shows up, like, 
you didn't have to be here. I told you I was fine. Because we see there that it's not just a response to her mom. It's a response to anybody. She doesn't want to be vulnerable in front of other people. So she was probably hoping that she could come to this funeral by herself, deal with her emotions all alone, and just put on a happy face. To me, I didn't see it like that. No? I saw it as she said, she tells her boyfriend, don't come because I said I was fine. But at the same time, she's happy that he did show up because it kind of shows her that there are some nice people doing good things. Mm. And she seems a little surprised by it. Like, I told you not to come, but you came anyway. You care about me. This is weird. Oh, I did not see it that way. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Mine was a lot sadder. <laughs> um, I love how they use yeah. the the mugshot of her dad and they didn't even wouldn't even consider to crop out like the plate that has his info on it. Like, nope. No, why would I do that? Let's just have all of it in there. That's too much effort. Not going to like Photoshop him on to some like guy on a horse or something. What? Okay, you're going to put his head on, like, some super buff dude on a horse? Sure, like The Rock or something. Okay. <laughs> I think that might have been worse. Um, <laughs> Maybe. And the fart shaped like a man. Love that, that was line. great. Yeah. Very perfect. Um, Eleanor's mom trying to play off as her sister and then yelling at her ex-husband about blowing her cover. She's the worst. Mm -hmm. Like, she's the worst, but I love her. I like, I watch the scenes and I just laugh and laugh and laugh. What's it's with her eyebrows? Good. Oh, I don't know. They're like going way past where they should. Well. They're huge. <laughs> I didn't These even These eyebrows notice. are from like, I don't know, some weird European fashion model. <laughs> okay. I did not notice. How did you not notice? They were like half of her head. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm going to have to go back and look at it. Huh. Let us know if you were not the only one who noticed that her eyebrows are gigantic. Hashtag Eleanor's mom's eyebrows to the moon. <laughs> oh my god. It's maybe a, too long of a hashtag, but... You can tell that you don't use Twitter. Right. <laughs> I'll use up all my 140 characters for the hashtag. <laughs> hashtag Eleanor's mom's eyebrows are like super long, guys, and I don't know why we're not talking about this. Oh, ran out of characters <laughs> let's move on tahani is crushed by her unsuccessful party and michael makes an unplanned speech at gunner's birthday michael continues to unravel and after a flashback of eleanor's breakdown in a bed bath and beyond she comforts him meanwhile jason comforts tahani the following day michael thanks eleanor for her help and we flash to tahani and jason in bed together what oh my god so first of all the party Michael does his little speech, which is fantastic. The whole birth is a curse and everything. What I noticed watching it for the third, fourth time was that Eleanor has this look on her face when Michael says, don't be sad, guys. Like she realized he's acting just like her mom. Kind of like a, oh boy, he's doing exactly what she used to do. That was toxic. Stop being sad. Well, just this idea of like, don't be sad, guys. It's like, no, you can feel sadness. Yeah, it's not a great feeling, but you have to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. Can't bottle them up. Push them down. Whatever. Um, Who is he talking to at this point? Everyone at the party? Everyone, I think. I think he's mostly talking to himself. Like, don't be sad. Don't be sad. Just don't think about it. Just don't be sad. Right. You know all these things, but just don't, like, pay attention to them. Um, and then he says, gonna knock out a few push-ups, and then we can list our favorite cheeses. What are your favorite cheeses, Jason? Go. Brie. <laughs> You've just got a list and has one cheese on it? It's the only cheese you need. Nah, that yep. is very much not true. Nope. You know it. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure Brie is the only good cheese. You never buy Brie. You only buy it's cheddar. It's so expensive. Okay, well, you only buy cheddar. Are you saying that cheddar is no good? Not compared to Brie. Oh, goodness. What about you? What's your favorite cheese? You have like a billion you love cheese probably applewood smoked cheddar oh that is a good cheese that's a good cheese it really is yeah not too much of it though i did try to make an entire pot of mac and cheese using only that kind of cheese before <laughs> it was not good good you... in concept terrible in execution exactly it was like super strong i should have used a little bit of that mostly cheddar though yeah just like regular cheddar okay amateur 
Moving past the cheese discussion, which yeah. I didn't think was ever a thing I was going to say on this podcast. Mm-hmm. What did you think of our final flashback? I loved it. Yeah? I really did. Good. Because I did too. <laughs> it was very cute, very sad, very fitting, and extremely well acted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Kristen Bell did great. Yeah, I really love that her breakdown came at this really random moment because it just felt so true to life. That can definitely happen with unsuspecting. Suddenly you see something and you have no idea where these feelings come from. Yeah. Yeah, you just see something that reminds you of maybe a person or a certain situation and then all of a sudden you're in tears. Or a life that you never knew you wanted. Yeah. And you never had. Yeah. Yeah. Emotions can really come out of nowhere and hit you like a freight train. So everything that Eleanor says about this toothbrush family is really sweet, but it's all this stuff that she never had as a kid, which I think probably complicates her feelings further. It's like, this is what my life was supposed to be like, and it's not what my life was like. And why am I feeling sad about a guy who was barely a dad to me? Why am I sad about his death? I feel like she's feeling a lot of emotions at this point, like a lot of different things are going through her head. And I feel that from her when she's saying her little speech about the toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't expecting this moment either. And as cartoony as it is, it still really works. Like her grabbing the toilet plunger. Of course, that's funny when she reacts to the family pack of Kleenex. Family pack? That was Ah! great. Oh, perfect. But everything before that is actually like really effective. Very emotional. Mm -hmm. Good job. Writers, good job, Kristen Bell. And in contrast to that, Tahani's feelings of sadness in this episode just feel really stupid. And they kind of bug me. But maybe that's sort of the point. Because Because they're so superficial? No, but because even if you feel sadness over something superficial, you're still feeling sadness, right? You shouldn't discount your emotions. You shouldn't, depending on what makes you feel them Mm -hmm. and i think for tahani her success as an event planner is very tied into her identity right so i don't think it's simply oh well someone had better floral arrangements than i did it's sort of someone is better than me and i stink i'm no good it reflects on her as a person instead of just being about the event And that's what bugs her. She doesn't think that should be affecting her like that. She doesn't want to be the person who gets emotional because of a crappy event or being upstaged by somebody else. But who hasn't had sadness because of that, right? Right. But I think that's where she's coming from. Mm. She doesn't want to be like that because she doesn't think that matters. She's finally coming to grips with the fact that She's extremely superficial, Mm. or she was extremely superficial in her life. And what do you think about Jason's comforting words? I love Jason this episode. When he's talking to Tahani about how awesome she is and how dope she is, you can really tell he means it. Mm -hmm. He absolutely 100% thinks she's amazing. Yeah, he's genuine. He's not smart enough to lie about this. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we need people that are genuine in our lives. And uh, I think that's what Tahani really appreciates from him in that moment. So we'll keep Jason in this zone, in this episode. We'll keep his intelligence at this level and his his heart. We just won't make him dumb like last episode. Yeah, I hope we won't anyway. I hope the writers won't because we we really don't have any say. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, we have Eleanor's speech to Michael which I think is perfection. I love it. Because it's so true. All humans are aware of death, so we're all a little bit sad all the time. And if you try and ignore your sadness, it just ends up leaking out of you anyway. Very true. Is that true? Are we all a little sad all the time? I think so. If you stop to think about it, you'll realize that it's probably true. A little bit. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit. I don't think that... Our lives are full of happiness and and wonder all the time. I think that we live with sadness and pain and frustration and anger 
And that doesn't mean that life isn't beautiful. It's just that we are aware that life sucks sometimes and that it will come to an end for all of us. And that's a painful part of existence, right? But that is existence. That is being human. Yeah. Acknowledging existence means acknowledging death. That's why we say ignorance is bliss, right? Yep. And I forgot to mention earlier that Jason's advice to be nicer to yourself is very touching and a very good reminder to basically everyone I know, including myself. You who's listening, be nicer to yourself. Absolutely. You know what? You're awesome. You're fantastic. Don't even trip, dog. Yeah, don't trip, dog. Be nicer to yourself. I'm just being Jason at this point. (gasps) Sorry. So right at the end of the episode, we get Michael and Eleanor. They're going to start their first proper ethics lesson. And right before, Michael actually says thank you. He says, I'm really glad that you pulled me out of my funk. Thank you for that. And it's this really sweet moment. And it reminded me of a quote from a YouTube video that I just watched um, the other day on Fyodor Dostoevsky's work. Uh, It's from the School of Life. I will put it in the show notes if you want to check it out. The narrator says, Part of our life's journey is to engage in the tricky task of disentangling ourselves from what we think we're like in order to discover our true nature. The protagonist is especially interesting because of the direction this self-discovery takes. His striking realization is that he's actually a much nicer person than he takes himself to be. Dostoevsky wants to reveal that beneath the so-called monster, there can very often be a far more interesting, tender-hearted character lurking. So in this video, he's referring to the protagonist of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. But I feel like this really applies to Eleanor and to Michael as well. Mm -hmm. Michael thinks of himself as this immortal evil being and he's just there to torture all of them. And he's still in this plan was like, yeah, I'm here to torture you, but I'll work with you, I guess. There's no need for him to say thank you to Eleanor. That doesn't make his life any easier. That doesn't accomplish any of his goals that he's stated. Maybe he really is just a much nicer person than he thinks he is. Their quartet is breaking Michael down. I think so. I hope so. I want him to end up being nice. A big change. Just like when the villain becomes part of the hero's group. So like Spike. Yes! (laughs) <laughs> absolutely i was thinking of spike the entire time i was listening to uh, this video of you were yeah i mean it fits it totally fits exactly and like i've said before who doesn't love a redemption story anyway anyway yeah just putting it out there just thoughts anywho to be fair spike's redemption story takes five seasons if this redemption story for michael actually happens I don't think it can happen over one season. Oh, no, 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 not at all. I would think... I hope not. No. If they tried to, I think it would come off as very inauthentic. Yes. Yeah. Very forced. Mm -hmm. And because we've been talking about existentialism this episode, I wanted to comment on some comparisons that fans have made. So several fans have compared season one of The Good Place to Jean-Paul Sartre's no exit. The source of the quote, hell is other people. So a lot of people think, oh, when Eleanor discovers that this is actually the bad place, that we should have known all along because hell is being around other people, right? But this quote has actually been misunderstood so many times that Jean-Paul Sartre actually came out and said, no, you're misunderstanding what I'm trying to say. And he said, It has been thought that what I meant was that our relations with other people are always poisoned, that they are invariably hellish relations. But what I really mean is something totally different. I mean that if relations with someone else are twisted, then that other people can only be hell. Why? Because when we think about ourselves, when we try to know ourselves, we use the knowledge of us which other people already have. We judge ourselves with the means other people have and have given us for judging ourselves. Into whatever I say about myself, someone else's judgment always enters. Into whatever I feel within myself, someone else's judgment enters. So I like this because it actually still works for season one of The Good Place. 
Eleanor is always going to think that Tahani is condescending and superficial. Tahani is always going to think that she's better than Eleanor. Chidi is always going to think that Eleanor is selfish. Eleanor is always going to think that Chidi is boring and dirty. And everyone's always going to think that Jason is stupid and has nothing to contribute. So this is perfect because everybody is stuck together seeing each other through the lens of another person. So it still works, but just not in the way that I think a lot of fans figure it does. Mm -hmm. Of course, hell sometimes is just being around other people. As an introvert, I very much agree with that sentiment. When I was looking up No Exit after watching season one, I was only doing the comparison of the content. Mm, Definitely. Like the play itself is very similar. And then because I was curious, and right at the end of the episode, Chidi mentions the book that they're going to be studying, uh, Death by Todd May. I think he brings that up pretty quickly. I don't know if Michael's quite ready for that, but... Maybe give him like a day to just like soak in with this new acceptance of his mortality. So I looked up this book because I have honestly never heard of it. And I'm just going to read a very quick summary of it. Because I think this book is actually going to be great for Michael and kind of makes me want to read it. So the summary is, The fact that we will die and that our death can come at any time pervades the entirety of our living. There are many ways to think about and deal with death. Among those ways, however, a good number of them are attempts to escape its grip. In this book, Todd May seeks to confront death in its power. He considers the possibility that our mortal deaths are the end of us and asks what this might mean for our living. What lessons can we draw from our mortality? And how might we live as creatures who die, and who know we are going to die? In answering these questions, May brings together two divergent perspectives on death. The first holds that death is not an evil, or at least that immortality would be far worse than dying. The second holds that death is indeed an evil, and that there is no escaping that fact. May shows that if we are to live with death, we need to hold these two perspectives together. Their convergence yields both a beauty and a tragedy to our living that are inextricably entwined. In the end, he argues, it is precisely the contingency of our lives that must be grasped and which must be folded into the hours or years that remain to each of us so that we can live each moment as though we were at once a link to an uncertain future and yet perhaps the only link we have left. So to me, this seems positive seems like we're exploring what death might mean but also realizing that it's good we need it we need death and eternity would be worse and to see death as a reason to live life to the fullest yolo yeah pretty much um in an episode of six feet under a fantastic show by the way if you're not watching it you really should be there's an episode where someone asks why do people have to die And the response was to give life meaning. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how this feels to me. So moving away from philosophy entirely, Tahani and Jason. Seems like they're pairing up all the uh, original soulmates, huh? Do you think they're getting together because they're the only humans in existence right now? I don't really know... As much as I predicted Tahani and Jason getting together, I actually thought it was going to... Yeah, I did. Well, in this episode, I did. okay. Yeah, I predicted that they would get together as I was watching it because there was just so much comfort, so much familiarity between them in this episode that I thought, oh, are they going somewhere with this? Or is this just going to be like a nice moment of the two of them comforting each other? Which, by the way, would have been fine. They don't actually have to have sex for her to be comforted. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Throws a wrench in the gear. Gives us a little twist, I guess, right? Because everyone's still hoping that Jason and Janet's going to be a thing. And I don't really think that Tahani and Jason was on a lot of people's radar. So it's definitely an interesting twist. I just don't really know what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. I guess I thought maybe they would kiss at the end of the episode. Like Tahani would give Jason a kiss as sort of like a thank you, maybe? I cannot picture them kissing. Well, we might see it happen. Weird. Yeah. I'm trying to imagine it now, and I just, like, a passionate kiss. Mm. I just can't picture it. Jason's I can't too... really picture a passionate kiss between Chidi and Eleanor, but it doesn't mean I don't want one. Yeah, it's true. 
it's just I haven't seen it yet. I can't. I'm terrible maybe at like imagining things, but. The most we've seen from our couples is them lying in bed together. Tahani and Jason, yeah, we didn't see them kiss. And Eleanor and Chidi, we did not see them kiss in that They thing, were just in bed. Which I'm kind of glad about because I don't want the kiss to have been a moment that Eleanor's watching. Their first kiss on the show anyway, because I still feel like it's going to come up. Okay. It's definitely going to happen at some point. Fair. And I want to be there and present for it. And I'm going to be right in front of my TV cheering them on. Tomorrow. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. If it happens tomorrow, I'm going to knock the coffee table out of the way and I'm going to shove my face into the TV. And get a nice, big, (laughs) messy threesome kiss in there. No. I just want to see it up close. Okay. (laughs) so Pixel perfect. (laughs) Mm, Look at those juicy pixels. Oh, my God. You're the worst. Okay. (laughs) So... One of our listeners actually sent us a message on Twitter, Christy, to say that it kind of felt like Jason was cheating on Janet at this moment. I've seen a few comments like that. Yeah, and this doesn't read to me as cheating because that happened 801 attempts ago, and they don't seem to remember that they were married. They've had 300 plus years since then. And somehow they have not gotten back together, which makes me sad. Don't get me wrong. We don't actually know whether they haven't gotten back together. That's true. We've gotten no indication that they have, but we've gotten no indication that they haven't. Fair enough. Very right. Okay. I am still... I don't know how I feel about this. Right. I don't know. Because technically they're married, but at the same time they're not because... Their marriage wasn't actually legally binding in any way, and Janet doesn't seem to have any romantic feelings for him, so... And Janet's been deleted. Yeah, she well, rebooted. she's been rebooted so many times, right? Right. So some might say the Janet that did marry Jason d- no longer exists. Yeah, some might say that. The whole thing is very confusing. I think it's fair to go past that and not think that Jason's a cheater because mm-hmm. that's unfair. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't classify him as a cheater at all. He it's not like he's consciously doing something bad. Exactly. No, no. I guess this just seems very random. I was not expecting it. I still hope that Jason and Janet will become a thing at some point. So maybe I just imprinted like a baby duck. You know, I saw the two of them together and I was like, yep, that's it. You mean like Jacob? Oh, my God. And Renesme? Oh, my God. You had to bring that up. Worst oh, book ever. Of course I had to. Okay. Nope. It's not what I meant. All right. So... Tahani and Jason, maybe we'll see more of that next week. I am interested, but also a little worried about where they're going with that. I really don't want them to do some stupid love triangle thing where, like, Janet gets upset because that just doesn't seem like it should happen. It would make no sense. Anyway, because of the unlikeliness of doing a triangle, I think I'm actually looking forward to it more than I'm dreading it, which is good. I mean, we might get to see Tahani in bed again. Naked. You appreciated that, huh? <laughs> that I did not appreciate it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I did too. So yeah, that's pretty much our episode. Should we dive into the mailbag? Yeah. Let's get down to business to read all your mail. You asked us for our insight, so we must prevail. You're our favorite bunch of listeners, and you can bet before we're through, somehow we'll get some mail out of you. (laughs) Holding that note. Get it, Jason. Get it. (laughs) Okay. So our first piece of mail comes from Jan O'Lantern at JLMO on Twitter. She said, I've got a wild theory that Chidi remembers the past times. That's why he's changed so much. His punishment is teaching ethics over and over. Hmm. Oh, boy. That would be a doozy. Yeah. Chidi would tell everyone. Because he doesn't like lying. Yeah. Yeah, probably. I like wild theories like that. Yeah, it's fun. Especially when they turn out to be true. And you're like, what? I totally called it my 1% chance. Booyah. (laughs) So, Jan, you're going to figure out if you're right or not soon, probably. We got an email from James who said, I just watched last week's episode. Okay, hold on. 
just to let you know, James, I got your email before I'd seen the episode because we were out of town and we hadn't watched the episode and I was like, oh, I got an email. This is awesome. Yeah, by the way, he's checking his emails. We're at a friend's wedding. Like, get off your phone. But anyway. (laughs) I was waiting for food. Okay, that's true. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got an email. This is awesome. I'll, I'll just quickly read this. Because I was only checking my phone like once every six hours or so because we had no Wi-Fi. So I was like, oh, this is great. And then I open it up and the first sentence was like, hey, Jason and Tahani. Jason and Tahani sleeping together. And I was like, oh, crap. Definitely spoiled. It wasn't your fault. I mean, we run a podcast about the show. We probably should have watched the show or waited until we'd watched it before we read our emails. Yeah, probably. I, I'd say that second option because we really just couldn't watch it. Yeah. So <laughs> that was a doozy. Anyway. Anyway. To address your point, you say, I just watched last week's episode and seeing Tahani and Jason sleep together made me sad. I know he and Janet aren't together in this timeline, but it still felt like cheating a little. He and Janet have gotten together every time they could, and it just felt like sleeping with Tahani came out of left field. I hope it doesn't end up going anywhere because the writers made it seem like Jason and Janet were a solid ship. Do you think it's weird that they're making the original soulmate matches relevant again? So we kind of talked about this earlier. Yeah, we did. We covered the the idea of Jason cheating and we both agree that it's not cheating in this moment. It does feel weird to us as an audience, though. I agree. Because we saw so much of Jason and Janet in season one. And it's not as though they had some sort of breakup. So it's very likely that they could end up very happy together again. So I think part of that feeling is coming through here. Mm -hmm. We're letting our own emotions get in the way because we didn't see it finalized. Mm -hmm. It's still happening in our own heads, even though the show has told us it is not. Yeah, and then they gave us hope in the first episode and a couple little moments here and there too where Jason and Janet seem to mesh well together they seem to understand each other and have a moment of connection right i don't know if they're really going to go anywhere with this but i feel like they wouldn't just put it in as oh they slept together that one time and we're never going to talk about it again they have to do something with it Mm -hmm. so perhaps tahani and jason will attempt a relationship but i don't think it will be successful Mm -hmm. i would be surprised to see it i think jason jason would be happier with somebody who can reciprocate emotions oh interesting i just assumed from tahani's point of view that she would get tired of jason's stupidity Hmm. and as much as he is well-meaning and sweet and all these other things he wouldn't be able to hold an intellectual conversation with her which i think would drive her crazy interesting Mm -hmm. what do you think jason do you hope that janet and jason will get back together do you hope that Tahani and Jason will make it work somehow, those two crazy kids? I think the writers have written themselves into a corner. Oh. Unintentionally, because the show introduced the idea of soulmates, and we only have four humans in this show. Mm -hmm. So there's not really a whole lot of possibility. There's a bunch of different combos we could try out. Yep. But... But in the end of the day, it's still going to be just those four. Mm Mm-hmm. So... To placate the audience, they have to put somebody together. It's Mm. just something that happens in television, and it's pretty much inevitable. That there will be romance. That there's going to be romance. So, James, we're going to be riding this wave along with you. We're feeling those feels, too. And uh, hoping it ends up in a good place for everybody. Pun intended. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. (laughs) That's good. Okay. So Jessica Trevino emailed us and she she says, you mentioned that Eleanor looks sad while in the grocery store. And I wanted to point out that we can infer from the other two memories that this is Eleanor going shopping for her solo birthday because the other two flashbacks were of her birthday. That makes very uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, I actually didn't think about that. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of sad that she died on her birthday. Yeah. And sad that she was alone on her birthday again. Mm-hmm. So you continue Jessica continued to say that she's splurging on shrimp and single lady margarita mix. She's sad because it's another birthday where she only has herself and she chose that. But I think it's still wearing on her. Like, here's another year of me being me. 
Me being alone. Me being alone. I'm happy about it, but I'm still alone. Yeah. And maybe it's becoming less pleasant Mm -hmm. as time goes on. I can definitely see what you're talking about here, Jessica. Mm -hmm. But I really like that you assume that it's Eleanor's birthday. I think that's great because if we see three birthdays, three important birthday moments in her life, I Mm -hmm. think that's... That's some good uh, symmetry. Yeah, I like that. Or that's some good... That's a good three beat. That's a good three beat. Mm -hmm. Jessica continues to talk about Janet and her personhood and how we may be looking at Janet incorrectly when it comes to who she is and her role in The Good Place. Mm -hmm. So during episode seven of our podcast... We evaluated Janet's personhood based on five criteria. As defined by Mary Ann Warren, who's uh, an American philosopher. So the five bits of criteria are number one, consciousness, and uh, basically the ability and the capacity to feel pain. Number two, reasoning and the ability to solve new and complex problems. Three, self-motivated activity. So deciding to do something for herself. Four, the capacity to communicate by whatever means. And five, the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness, whether she is aware of herself as a person. Mm -hmm. So those were the criteria that we followed. And we're not saying that they're infallible. Definitely not. Um, And Janet is a special case. But So what Janet is and is not is still unknown. Mm -hmm. However, we can deduce from what we've seen and heard her say and what we've seen on screen is that she is a mixture. Mm -hmm. She's like a weird, autonomous, mechanical being who is not mechanical at all. Yeah. I don't know. Janet is very complex and I feel like... See, that's the problem. I don't think she's complex. I think she's extremely simple in the fact that what we see is exactly what she is. What we see and what she's told us is exactly that. But I feel like she's more complex because we've seen her change and evolve. Mm -hmm. So personally, I think she's very complex. And I think the show is still trying to figure out exactly where to go with her and trying to answer the same question as us. Is she a person? And how much should we treat her like a person? Because... To change her and make her act like Jeanette is not something that should be acceptable if she was a person, right? She wouldn't. I don't think she would accept that herself. Yeah, exactly. She might have a problem with that. Mm Mm-hmm. So the show's kind of playing around with it, but I like what you brought up in your email, Jessica. She said, I think you may be looking at Janet from too much of a human perspective. When deciding Janet's personhood, it's not enough to look at the fact that she's following her program, but rather how she's following her program. Is she coming up with creative solutions? Helping others without being asked? Maybe looking at deeper problems the humans have and trying to solve those rather than the superficial issues? Okay. I think she is absolutely capable of doing all those things that you mentioned, but doing them of her own accord would not happen. She's not programmed with a desire, with an urge to do anything, with a will of her own. It's very exciting to watch Janet as the season progresses. And I believe there was an interview with Michael Schur before last week's episode where he definitely hinted that there's much more to Janet than we have seen. Ooh. And that there's lots of Janet reveals this season. Oh, man. Okay. So I'm very excited about that then. We love Janet. Okay. Our next bit of mail comes from Kate at I Do Human Things. And she said, This episode solidified what we all suspected. Tahani is the weakest link. She falls for a torture attempt after being told about it. I know, right, Kate? Yeah, I know. Come on. It's totally ridiculous. She seems to be the stubborn one of the group, for sure. This episode was great for Jason, almost exclusively. The wisdom we've seen in him before comes out in very smooth and believable fashion. His wisdoms are just that. Wisdom. No intellectual pretension needed. The purest empathy I've seen portrayed and I found myself kind of shipping them. Though with that sex scene came a bit of sadness, this could mean no Jason Janet in the future. Yep, we're right there with you. Or, or... A happy threesome? 
Yes. Ooh. Don't uh, don't dismiss polyamory. You know, it could happen. Five some. Yep. Let's just make Six everybody some. in love. Throw Michael in there. Nah, Michael can just fork off. <laughs> just you know. At this Harsh. point, I trust him, but not with my heart. Okay. So there's that. Okay. I do like your point, Kate, about the episode relying too heavily on jokes that don't quite feel right. <laughs> Janet jokes can stay. And damn, did you see that butt? Oh, we did. We did. We did. It was we good. Definitely did. It was real good. <laughs> I don't think any version of Eleanor we've seen before is Velociraptor versus Valedictorian level stupid. Agreed. I don't think anybody would make that mistake. No. Whatsoever. Come on. And you, you can't tell me that Eleanor didn't think dinosaurs were the coolest. I see what and you're saying. And there's no way she didn't see Jurassic Park. I mean, come on. Right. Pair, like you said in this email, Kate, uh, pairing it in the same episode where she uses the word ennui seems a little bizarre. Yeah, because okay. Because it's definitely not an Eleanor word. But uh, I don't think you're being too picky. I think... Those are legitimate concerns, but... Yeah, we should keep a little consistency in their intelligence levels, right? Mm -hmm. They seem to be fluctuating, all our characters, but that's okay. You know, everyone has their area. All in all, this episode... Good. I enjoyed it quite a bit. But I think perhaps because it focused so heavily on existentialism, and that is one of my favorite things, I just think it's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I really love... A lot of the literature that came around that time, and in particular, the playwright Samuel Beckett, who writes a lot of um, plays that deal with the absurd and this existential crisis that we encounter. So I just, I don't know. It's just my nerdy love that I think fuels a lot of my affection for this episode. That's fair. Yeah. And I do love Eleanor's more sincere moments. Yes. I think that's one of my favorite flashbacks of anybody. Probably mm. one of my favorite scenes, a serious scene, is uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. Yeah. And that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshit, a multiverse radio production. We want to hear your thoughts, so rip a page up from a philosophy textbook and uh, shove it in a non-robot mouth. Do it now. We'll get it. Yeah. And then we'll... We'll get it, and then we'll be rebooted, and then, uh, yeah, it'll just be I a whole mess. I was just going to say, we'll acknowledge your mail in our next episode. Yeah, or we'll think it's soup. Yeah. That might happen, too. So, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, and you can use the hashtag FBullshirt. We're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can email us from our website, multiverseradio.ca. If you have a suggestion on next week's mail song, let us know. Yeah. Do you want to hear more Disney songs? More Steven Universe songs? That's all we've covered so far. More Cher songs. Ooh, Cher. Do you David believe Bowie songs. in life after mail? <laughs> all right, guys. Thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you next week for a review of Season 2, Episode 6, The Trolley Problem. Ooh, who's going to solve it? Oh, I already know what that's about, and I'm excited because it's more philosophy. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Tahani is crushed by her unsuccessful party. Do you want to say that again? Because yep. you said it like, un- <laughs> I said unsuccessful party. Unsuccessful party. Unsuccessful party. What's a unsuccessful party? Is that like when the Huns show up yeah, and you're like, all that of was them. successful? Yeah, it was a successful Let's hun- get down yeah. to business to succeed the Huns. <laughs> no, okay, bye. Oh, that should be our male song. <laughs>